Greetings, YouTubers. Welcome to episode number two of the Backpacker Fact Checker. The goal here is to take a critical look at some of the trail tales that get repeated over and over again, often without proper references. And if you missed it, episode number one investigated shoe weight and the old rule that one pound on your feet equals five pounds on your back. Today's topic is the heat lost through your head. In discussing the importance of keeping warm when it's cold, many have repeated the claim that you lose 40 to 45 percent of your body heat through your head. So it's disproportionately important to put on a hat. When any time you see numbers, whether it's twice as much or 40 to 45 percent, it should trigger your show me response. Numbers, even if they are estimates, need to come from measurements, and measurements mean testing. In this case, the source for the 40 to 45 percent of your heat is relatively well known. From the U.S. Army Survival Manual in the section on basic principles of cold weather survival, you can lose 40 to 45 percent of body heat from an unprotected head and even more from the unprotected neck, wrist, and ankles. Now, obviously, the head does not make up almost half of your entire body's surface area, so the reason for this outsized heat loss through the head is explained as follows. And these areas of the body are good radiators of heat and have very little insulating fat. And because there is much blood circulation in the head, most of which is on the surface, you can lose heat quickly if you do not cover your head. It sounds intuitive, so it's easy to accept, but technically this fact is not referenced. So where did the author of the survival manual get these numbers? Now, I'm definitely not the first person to fact check this. I found multiple places that referred to a 2006 study that was later reaffirmed by a 2008 study. Well, in a lesson as to why you should always track down all alleged references, I discovered that the 2008 study wasn't actually a study at all. Sure, it was published in the prestigious British Medical Journal, but it's actually just a fun little article on some festive medical myths. And these two paragraphs are the entire section on head heat loss. And they cite the U.S. Army Manual as the source for the claim that 40 to 45 percent of body heat is lost through the head. And the authors then point out, and if this were true, humans would be just as cold if they went without trousers as if they went without a hat. But patently, this is just not the case. And their point's a good one. On its own, the claim doesn't pass a sniff test. For burn assessment of patients in the hospital, they make body surface area charts like this. If you add up all the lefts, rights, fronts, and backs of the lower body regions for an adult, you get exactly 40 to 45 percent, depending on whether or not you include the buttocks. To illustrate further, take Kyle here and put him in clothes. A head equals 45 percent rule implies that he would be, in the words of the BMJ article, just as cold if he swapped his trousers for a hat. And as noted, that seems doubtful. And before you rush to the complaint desk, nobody is saying that hats don't help. If you're cold, by all means, put on a hat. The warmest setup of all is to wear everything. And this is just about the relative value of a hat against the rest of the body. So the BMJ article suggests this myth probably originated with an old military study in which test subjects wore Arctic survival suits, but no hats. Because it was the only part of the subject's bodies that was exposed to the cold, they lost most heat through their heads. You could generate this same kind of exaggeration by leaving only the hands or the feet uncovered, or whatever body parts you choose. The real number, they say, for heat loss through the head isn't 40 to 45 percent. It's more like 10 percent, and a reference for that is provided. And then the article concludes, any uncovered part of the body loses heat and will reduce the core temperature proportionally. And I need to draw your attention to the word and. Technically, that makes this two separate conclusions, not one. And we'll want to keep that in mind as we proceed to look at the study referenced in this article. So that study is the thermal effects of whole head submersion in cold water on non-shivering humans, published in the Journal of Applied Physiology in 2006. So basically what researchers did was dunk a series of test subjects in 17 C water with sensors placed on various parts of their heads and bodies. And as the subjects responded to the cooling effects of submersion, the sensors allowed measurements of both energy production and loss by region of the body. Figure four shows some of the results. In order to see what role the head played in heat loss, four conditions were tested. With bodies insulated, subjects were submerged in two ways. 
one with heads out and again with heads underwater. Then head in and head out were tested again, this time with the bodies uninsulated. So the chart shows the heat energy loss for each region of the body and the head. And note that total loss includes whole body cutaneous and respiratory heat loss, meaning it's the heat loss through your skin plus what is lost in your warm breath. And figure three shows the heat loss through skin over time for each of the four conditions. You can see the big spike in heat loss at time zero when the participants were initially dunked into the water. And then over the next 30 minutes of submersion, you can see how each condition varied. So regarding the central question of whether or not the head experiences extraordinary heat loss, the study authors state, the present results are consistent with previous data in that the supposition of proportionately greater heat loss from the head was not supported. The head, which is about 7% of surface area, accounted for approximately 10% heat loss. And these results thus indicate that heat loss from the head is not disproportionately increased over what would be expected from the head's contribution to whole body surface area. Now, technically, you could argue that a 10% loss from 7% area is at least a small amount of overrepresentation. But remember that our original claim was 40 to 45% from the head. When these results indicate it's actually more like 10%. So on that basis, I'm prepared to rate the claim as false. Now, as with literally any study, there are both precautions and limitations. On the one hand, they used multiple subjects to average the effects and guard against outliers. And there were numerous sensors to separately measure different regions of the body. And they even gave the participants drugs to prevent shivering. So the heat generated by the muscles during that process would not confound these results. And on the other hand, submerged subjects wore goggles and a mask for their breathing apparatus, so you could argue that those might affect the results. And some might be concerned about whether submersion in water is comparable to air exposure. Well, the thermal conductivity of air is only 0 0.025 watts per meter Kelvin, while water is 0.592. So water will suck heat out of you with over 23 times the conductivity of air. They are both fluids, however, so the issues with current and convection will at least be analogous. So in one respect, the greater response in water could be viewed as an advantage. When looking at very tiny effects, they can sometimes be drowned out by the inherent noise in an experiment, thereby getting lost in the fog of statistical insignificance. So researchers might resort to a similar but amplified situation so as to magnify those results well enough to be seen properly. All I can do is give you what I found. What to make of it is up to you. Okay, that's claim number one. But remember from the BMJ article, there was a second claim introduced. Any uncovered part of the body loses heat and will reduce the core body temperature proportionally. Well, despite how you might feel after a huge steak dinner, you are not just a static sack of meat. Your circulating blood carries with it a lot of heat, making you rather thermodynamically fluid inside. So it's not a foregone conclusion that you will always lose heat from your surface area and your core at the same rates. And as it happens, the dunk test study didn't just measure heat loss at the skin. They also took measurements of body core temperature over time. So figure one shows the results for all four insulated, exposed, head in, head out test conditions. And if we compare the core temperature graph to the skin graph, you can sort of see what's coming. And they're different scales, obviously. We're only talking about the proportional differences. Still, you can tell that having the head exposed had a bigger effect on core temperature than it did to surface heat loss, relatively speaking. So the authors state, the present study confirms results from previous body exposed trials. Additional head cooling, in this case by total submersion, increased core cooling proportionately more than the increase in total heat loss. And as to why that might be, they say, this exaggerated core cooling likely results from the extra heat loss affecting a smaller thermal core due to peripheral vasoconstriction secondary to intense cold stimulation of the body and head. And vasoconstriction is the narrowing of the blood vessels by the contraction of their muscular wall. This shrinks the inner diameter of the vessels, and when that happens in the periphery, it has the effect of squeezing blood out of your limbs and back into your core. And the head seems to be particularly important to this response for at least two reasons. 
First, the ratio of head blood flow to surface area is four to 10 times greater than seen in the trunk and proximal limbs. So there is disproportionately large amount of blood flowing through your noggin. And second, there is little or no head skin vasoconstriction in response to cold, whether the cold stimuli came from the head alone or even during cooling of the whole body surface. You see, vasoconstriction is a defense response designed to protect your body's core from the cold. So things like your fingers and toes can act like cooling fins, as can your arms and legs themselves. So when things get chilly, your arteries and veins act to withdraw much of their blood from these regions of thermodynamic liability. That way, you're not pumping too much warm blood out to the edges where it will just get rapidly cooled off and then brought back to chill your core. But with the head, there are these two problems. It has a proportionately high amount of blood flowing through it, and that's compounded by the fact that there's no vasoconstriction in response to cold from there. This comes together to mean that dipping your head will have an amplified effect on core cooling compared to submerging other parts of your body. In this case, almost four times as much. And that means that I'm going to have to rate the second part of the BMJ's conclusion as false. The study they cited explicitly concludes otherwise. Wait, do we just fact check a fact check? All right. I wanted that moment, but we have to be fair. Part of what may be exaggerating the core cooling effect is a synergistically augmented, facially stimulated dive response. The diving reflex is a set of bodily reactions to being immersed. It's triggered specifically by chilling and wetting the nostrils and face while breath holding. And water has more than just greater thermal conductivity, it also has a greater ability to trigger vasoconstriction via this reflex. Now, the submerged subjects in the study weren't holding their breath, which the authors note reduces the dive response. But the water likely still triggered it more than just cold air would, so their finding of 39% more core cooling from an exposed head probably wouldn't hold if you're not underwater. It's likely still somewhat extra based on surface area, making claim number two still technically false, but maybe not by that much. Okay, in summary, the Army Manual's claim that 40 to 45% of your heat is lost through an unprotected head is unsupported by the available evidence. The study that all research roads lead to concludes it's more like 10%, which is close to being proportional to the head surface area. And the secondary claim discovered along the way that the head affects core temperature proportionally also appears to be false. Extra blood flow in the head, which does not restrict in the cold like elsewhere, can carry a chill into your core disproportionately, though it's not known by how much when the exposure is to air instead of water. And this does not mean that the head contributes to total heat loss disproportionately, which could seem counterintuitive at this point. The sack of meat, when dunked, will lose heat from the outside in. But your circulating self, however, is capable of losing heat from the inside out. The conclusions from this study suggest that your head doesn't cost you any extra heat based on its size. It might result in the heat loss going more directly to your middle rather than from your skin and then methodically through your outer flesh first. What might the use implications be? The study authors don't provide much in that way. The BMJ article concludes with, so if it's cold outside, you should protect your body, but whether you want to keep your head covered or not is up to you. I think their point is that after you put on a jacket, you've got options. The head is 7% of body area, but most hats don't cover the face, which is most of the front half of the head, say 3%. So you can put on a hat that covers the other 4%, or you can put on gloves that cover 6%. Gloves plus a neck gaiter would collectively have twice the coverage of just a hat. So with no part of the body more important to total heat loss than any other, you're free to pick and choose what parts to cover until you're satisfied. And the converse would also be true. I don't like stuff around my neck, so I'd be inclined to put on a hat before a scarf. And that's to say nothing of the style points one could accrue from an article of stylish headwear. Now that's in a comfort scenario, in a survival scenario where the cold is bad enough to actually be dangerous. Rather obviously, you should cover absolutely every part you can. In such a predicament, you might want to give extra consideration to what affects your core body temperature. 
So if it was a choice between hypothermia or frostbite, I know which one I would pick. That's it for this one, folks. As always, I very much appreciate your time and thanks for watching.